The French Revolution, coupled with the new social groups and antagonisms shaped by industrial transformation, were suggestive of the changes wrought in French politics and society as the 19th century progressed. Yet these changes were not only restricted to politics. Political and social modernization, as well as the new anxieties it bred, were also reflected in the cultural transformations that took place during the period. In the wake of the French Revolution, many intellectuals and critics were coming to appreciate that society was in a state of transition. If politics endeavored to forge new individuals, literature and the arts similarly had a role in expressing new attitudes and outlooks reflective of the new type of society. And more often than not, Paris proved to be an epicenter of this style of creativity. Paris itself appeared the embodiment of 19th century modernist trends. Osman city, with its capitalism and new urban planning, symbolized the rapid pace and extent of these new changes. The old Paris is no more, the poet Charles Baudelaire famously declared. The shape of a city changes faster than a human heart. The writer and renowned gastronome Charles Monsolet came to a similar conclusion, remarking, It is no longer the old Paris, but it is not yet the new Paris either. We are placed between memory and promise. This sense of transition extended to almost every aspect of life and culture in the 19th century. As one French art critic insisted in the late 1860s, we are between two worlds, one that is dying and one that is yet to begin. In the past, change had proceeded at a slower and more regulated pace. Yet as the 19th century progressed, it appeared that change was occurring more rapidly due to new technologies and forms of communication, new types of political movements, and new perspectives on society and the individual. Everything which had once been accepted and taken for granted could no longer be taken as such. How to represent this dynamic new world and how to capture its values and rhythms became a task which 19th century artists and writers applied themselves to, engendering a new spirit in the arts that critics did not fail to label modernism. The growth of modern cities and the emergence of new cultural forms had an impact on the literary world and would ultimately shape the emergence of a new style of narrative writing made evident in the modern novel. By the mid-19th century, French writers were coming to abandon many of the traditional and romantic ideas that had informed literature. Whereas once, writers had focused on the mysterious and exotic, seeking to portray the heroism of the human spirit, by the 1830s, many writers were reevaluating these familiar conventions. Rather than a heroism and mystery, writers argued it was essential to capture the social realities around them and to portray the daily struggles associated with modern life. Realism, as this approach became known, drew attention to the moral and intellectual concerns of the day, often presenting a panorama of modern bourgeois life, replete with all its shortcomings and dilemmas. Embodying this new outlook was Henri Bell, a novelist hailing from Grenoble, who would become known by his pen name, Stendhal. Having worked as a diplomatic official during the Napoleonic period, Stendhal found his fortunes changed with the collapse of the empire. During the 1820s and 1830s, he took up writing making a precarious living by his pen. Although often claiming to feel like a stranger in his own times, Stendhal had a knack for capturing the social mores of his own period, and what he presented was hardly flattering. He was convinced that bourgeois society lacked the grandeur and elegance of the old aristocratic past, insisting that money and social status were all the new social groups cared for. 
In fact, in his famous novel The Red and the Black, Stendhal chronicled the life of a young careerist driven by self-interest, a prototype for the modern bourgeois individual. His contemporary and fellow novelist, Henri de Balzac, had a similarly critical view of the bourgeoisie. Perhaps more than Stendhal, Balzac's characters embodied the new infatuation with money and social status that appeared to pervade July monarchy society. As one of his main protagonists, the aged Père Gorio, curtly remarked, money is life itself. And as many of Balzac's characters discovered, such an outlook was hardly the recipe for a rich and fulfilling life. Realism, as a literary convention, was a product of the new urban culture and lifestyle that modernization had produced. Writers like Stendhal and Balzac sought to capture modern bourgeois society, oftentimes condemning the materialism and greed it encouraged. The novel appeared the apposite medium for doing this, as writers use narrative and character development to tell stories filled with the drama of modern life. This emphasis on capturing daily life was central to the project, and writers like Balzac even compared their trade to a scientific exercise. Just as the scientist observed and categorized the natural world, the writer intended to describe and observe the modern condition. Yet this did not mean that realism was a purely descriptive art form. At its essence, it intended to lay bare the decline and sterility of modern bourgeois society, presenting the shortcomings and moral failings of a society driven by money and the need for recognition. Realism was a critique of modern life, just as much as a reflection of it. And in this respect, it marked a new form of cultural production that firmly entrenched the novel as a primary genre of the modern tradition. Writers like Stendhal and Balzac shared a certain contempt for bourgeois life that was evident in their fiction. It was a sentiment that they shared with other cultural elites and intellectuals, but not all writers were content to simply depict the shortcomings of modern society. Others presented literature as a potential alternative to the mediocrity that bourgeois life and society encouraged. For the novelist Gustave Flaubert, the literary arts were capable of serving as a substitute for the inadequacies and unfulfillment that accompanied modern life. As a writer, he claimed he sought out a perfect language, or as he put it, the mot juste, in which to convey and capture the human condition. Modern life might be flawed and filled with cliches, but a writer could seek out perfection in his prose and modes of expression suggesting that the creative act was the only means of true fulfillment. In line with this philosophy, Flaubert was known for spending long days writing, often scribbling a single paragraph that he would revise numerous times until each word was perfect. In his most famous novel, Madame Bovary, published in 1857, Flaubert depicted an ordinary housewife suffering from the tedium and boredom of provincial life. Combating her unfulfilling expectations with a series of adulterous affairs that would eventually lead to her downfall, Emma Bovary stood as a quintessential victim of modernity's vacuity and triviality. Flaubert's quasi-tragic heroine was an unsettling reminder of the inadequacies of reality, and his attempt to capture this banal story in a perfect language was a testament to his aesthetic philosophy of realism. Unfortunately, his depiction of adultery drew the contempt of critics, who found the subject too vulgar for the prude sensibilities of middle-class audiences. 
That year, the government censors brought Flaubert to court, charging him with offending public morals. The trial produced a sensation and quickly backfired on the government. Not only was Flaubert acquitted of all charges, the scandal transformed Madame Bovary into a bestseller, securing Flaubert's status as a writer of merit. The state prosecutor, Ernest Pinard, had hoped to not only use the court case to condemn Flaubert, he had hoped to put the entire genre of realist fiction on trial, discouraging others from treating such lewd subjects. This had severely miscarried, and after the acquittal, Pinar was desperate to find another victim in order to press his point. He did not have to look far, because that year, a new book came off the presses, one seemingly glorifying the type of decadence and eroticism so distasteful to bourgeois morals. The writer was Charles Baudelaire, and the book was Fleur du Mal. Garish and eccentric, Baudelaire had spent his youth living a style of life which he could scarcely afford, frequently trying to escape the boredom of modern life by imitating the lifestyle of a dissolute aristocrat. He lavished attention on prostitutes and socialized with drug abusers, joining with other writers in an informal group that took the name of the Hashishans. He had made a name for himself as the translator of the American author Edgar Allan Poe, and as an art critic and journalist. But by the 1850s, Baudelaire had yet to produce a work of any significant artistic merit. He spent the majority of his time wandering about the streets of Paris, making observations of the urban culture and environment, and indulging in long complaints about his precarious finances, ill health, and personal sense of melancholy. It is too late for me to be able to make even a small fortune, above all with my disagreeable, unpopular talent, he wrote to his mother in his typical dramatic flair. If ever I can recapture the sap and energy I have sometimes been capable of, I will vent my anger in terrifying books. I would like to raise the entire human race against me. That seems to me a pleasure which would console me for everything. While Baudelaire did not raise all of humanity against him, his book of poems, Fleur du Mal, was successful in outraging the sclerotic imperial censors. The poetic images of urban decay and moral debauchery stabbed directly at the heart of bourgeois sensibilities and artistic taste. Baudelaire had always been fond of shocking those around him, yet the grotesque nature of Fleur du Mal ran deeper than mere histrionics. Rejecting the idea that art was meant to be ennobling and even moralizing, he endeavored to portray modern life in all its grotesque splendors. In his estimation, the bourgeoisie were nothing but hypocrites, indulging in immoral practices in the privacy of their own homes, yet presenting a decorous facade in public. All the bourgeois fools who incessantly utter the words immoral, immorality, morality in art, and other silly things, remind me of a five-franc whore who, when accompanying me one day to the Louvre, where she had never been, stared up at the naked statues and started blushing and covering her face. In his depictions of modern Parisian life, with all its prodigality and license, Baudelaire laid bare the self-contradictions and abandon he believed bourgeois existence exemplified. The treatment of contemporary subject matter in his writing urged that modern society was something to be studied, dissected, and understood. To capture modern life, one could not rely on the conventions of the past. It required 
new methods of expression. Woe to him who studies the antique for anything else but pure art, logic, and general method, Baudelaire warned. Baudelaire's poetry expressed as much, capturing the rhythms and peculiarities of bourgeois Parisian life during the Second Empire. The poet's milieu was populated with criminals, prostitutes, workmen, and merchants, and could not be found in stuffy salons or museums. At all times, Baudelaire presented himself as a flaneur, an observer who extracted his art and truth from the sights and sounds around him. Brought to trial a year after Flaubert, Baudelaire did not escape the vindictive will of the censors. Fleur du Mal was found guilty of violating public morality, resulting in a stiff fine and the moral condemnation of the state. Although fame and prosperity eluded him throughout his life, Baudelaire's aesthetic considerations and depictions of la vie moderne were among the most important contributions to the modernist movement during the 1850s and early 1860s. As Baudelaire and others argued, the spectacles and drama of modern life were not to be found in the decorous salons of the bourgeoisie. They were found in the prostitutes and performers that lurked about the city streets, the stories carried in the daily newspapers, and in the ordinary details of everyday existence. As the art critic Jules Castagny insisted, real life contains all poetries. It is only a question of extracting them. This conviction was the essence of the new realist approach, and with it announced the emergence of a new cultural movement bent on rejecting the past and focusing on subjects that embodied the contemporary and modern. The most striking examples of the new realist modernist trend occurred in the realm of the fine arts. Traditionally, the arts had been the preserve of state cultural institutions and the patronage of court circles, and this was most explicit in France. Every year, the government supported an annual salon, in which both established artists as well as newcomers competed to have their work exhibited and critiqued. However, because it financed the Salon, the state also believed that it had the right to determine the character of these exhibitions, and this undoubtedly meant that they would favor the conservative traditions carefully guarded by the state-sponsored Fine Arts Academy, the École de Beaux-Arts. The school, and by association the Salon, were supervised by the prestigious Academy, and it was the Academy which determined which pieces received annual funding and prizes. In short, this august body was given the power of a cultural arbiter, deciding which types of art were of the highest achievements and therefore worthy of exhibition at major shows. And during the mid-19th century, the Academy of Fine Arts was practically dominated by the well-established painter and educator Jean-Auguste Dominique Angre. Angre was a staunch neoclassicist and a doyen of the academic artistic tradition. His taste favored imitating the greatness of the Greeks and the Romans. In his own words, Angre characterized himself as a conserver of good doctrines and not an innovator. It is a point of conviction to remain faithful to old convictions, to convictions that I shall never abandon, even at the last hour he told aspiring artists. Yet Angra's opinions and tastes were representative of the establishment and status quo. They favored well-tested doctrines on artistic sensibility and idealized classical works while expressing disdain for any artist 
with modernist pretensions. In his mind, innovators were nothing more than termites which gnawed away at the marrow until everything finally crumbles and nothing is left but dust. Like devils issuing from beneath the earth, he claimed, modernism overthrows and destroys everything. Yet for those who believed that Angers classicism was incapable of expressing the desires and sensibilities of a new era defined by fast-paced change and transformation, the exact point was to gnaw away at everything and challenge what had been handed down from their predecessors. In other words, to create a new art reflecting what was important to those living in the 19th century. As early as the 1840s, art critics had begun vocalizing desires for novelty and new forms of expression. The critic Théophile Gautier, an eccentric who harbored a despise for the prudery of bourgeois life and conventions, candidly challenged the notion held by men like Anger that art should inspire greatness and refined moral tastes. Modern life was vulgar, it was crude and complicated, and art needed to reflect these qualities. Rather than serving as a medium for morality and perfection, art had to be taken, in Gautier's opinion, on its own terms. Art for art's sake became his chief battle cry in the war against the academy, encouraging a form of art devoid of morals and open to experimentation with new types of expression, rather than relying on models taken from the past. This call to arms was equally embraced by Charles Baudelaire. In a work entitled The Painter of Modern Life, penned during the 1860s, Baudelaire called for a new type of artist who shunned traditions and instead sought to represent the passing moment by capturing all that was fugitive, ephemeral, and contingent, as he claimed. In his opinion, capturing the essence of the modern necessitated a careful study of the present. The artist was an observer who took what he found and drew out deeper meaning from it. Yet critics like Gautier and Baudelaire were hardly enthusiastic for everything the present age had to offer. While they appreciated innovation and change, they hardly had a taste for the trend toward greater democracy that the 19th century ushered in. Democracy, in their opinion, signified the triumph of mediocrity, encouraging an appreciation for the vulgar tastes of the masses and, as Baudelaire pointedly stated, a cheapening of hearts all around. With the rise of the masses, great art could not be expected. It was a period of leveling, and with this leveling came a degeneration of all things superior of taste and talent. Perhaps radical in their artistic sensibilities, these men were, nonetheless, conservative in their social and political outlooks, clinging to a dying elitism before the flood of democracy leveled all. Industrialization too was not welcomed. It transformed the beautiful into the ugly, they insisted and destroyed all that was noble. If they found the depictions of modern life fascinating, this did not entail they agreed with everything modernization brought. Like the realist novelists who were both engrossed with and repulsed by bourgeois society, early modernists were both excited by the possibilities that the modern had to offer, yet deeply troubled by what the process of modernization and industrialization was creating. In this respect, modernism signified a mood and ambiance that reflected a tension between the expectations of modernity and the traumatic experience of the modernizing process. Yet for all their contradictions, such critics would come to inspire a new generation of artists who placed faith in the idea of representing modern life accurately and faithfully, transforming modernism into a full-fledged artistic movement that would, in the coming years, inspire a variety 
of diverse movements. The leader among these new painters was Edward Manet. Repeatedly shunned by the Academy, Manet decided to exhibit his work independently and address the public directly in the late 1860s. In his works, he presented scenes from contemporary life and history. He depicted real nudes rather than idealized Greek physiques and attempted to demonstrate the capabilities of his so-called new painting style. Investing nearly all his money in these solo exhibitions, Manet was disappointed when it failed to draw any serious attention from either spectators or from the press. Yet, it did set a new precedent which was going to become a hallmark of the modernist movement, a belief that artists could in fact work outside the established channels and, as Manet claimed, seek out friends and allies in the struggle. And Manet did, in many respects, find friends and allies. Foremost among them was a group of painters including Claude Monet, Auguste Renoir, Camille Pizarro, and Paul Cezanne, the future nucleus of what would become the Impressionists. These individuals congregated in cafes and at each other's studios, earning themselves the name the Batignol Group, so called because they frequently met in the eponymous suburb located directly outside Paris. Through regular meetings and discussions, their little clique soon became a movement in its own right, one that increasingly assumed radical overtones. They drafted petitions calling for the liberalization of the Salon and the entire artistic establishment. Their protests associated the new art with a movement for greater freedom and artistic creativity, and this made their protests appear revolutionary and their message firmly anti-establishment at its core. Their efforts were publicized by key members of the press, who sympathized with this new generation of artists. Most prominent among these modernist spokesmen was Baudelaire himself, and the newcomer Emile Zola, an outspoken art critic and novelist who came to give modernism a clear definition and purpose in the public's mind. As a true ideologist of modernism, Zola imbued the movement with political and liberal overtones. In his mind, modernism was a form of radicalism, a revolt against state institutions and an attempt to transcend what existed in order to discover the full potential of artistic freedom. It was, he believed, not up to the state to determine what was culturally relevant, but rather the public and this made the movement essentially democratic and even republican in its very essence. Impressing for independent gallery exhibitions rather than showing in state-sponsored salons, the Impressionists contracted relations with notable art critics and art dealers, both of which contributed to their success and acceptance in the coming years. Their efforts were commendable, and by the 1880s, their style and belief that art should represent modern life would become widely accepted. In one of history's infinite ironies, a movement once deemed radical and even revolutionary had, by the end of the century, become the establishment. Modernism was a diverse movement that cut across different genres and mediums. Yet at its heart, it was reflective of a sense of change first stimulated during the years of the French Revolution. Exhortations to examine and depict modern life rather than rely upon the techniques and traditions of the past presented a new way of considering culture, and French writers and artists were clearly at the forefront of this trend. Yet movements like realism and modernism were something new in their own right, reflecting the urban environments and social relationships that had come about in the wake of the revolutionary period. 
In speculating on how art and literature should embody the sense of change evident across European societies, cultural producers came to fashion a new aesthetic. So-called modern art and writing challenged the establishment, and with it came to create a new cultural environment and set of cultural practices that would significantly redefine the literary and fine arts in the years ahead.